Right. <laughs> Alright, Tina, this this laptop is so slow. Really get it set up. Rough. Alright, I'm just trying to get my uh, environment set up right now so we can actually do something. All right, let me know if my uh, stream is laggy or anything, or if my audio is messed up. I'm on a new, different laptop today, so the stream might be a little bit lower quality, but hopefully we can still do some stuff. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, so the um the goal for this stream was to either help people with some JavaScript questions, or I have a couple of little like project ideas that I wanted to build out live. And so, like for example, the first one is a student test grade converter. So you can provide a numeric like zero through a hundred, and a program would tell you if you got an A, B, C, D, or an F. So that should be a really entry level project that you should know how to build yourself when you're learning. And uh, if you guys want to kind of watch me build that, let's just go ahead. Otherwise, I'm always open to questions while I'm doing this. So keep that in mind. So what we're trying to build is a student converter thing. So I'm going to go over to my web page here. And the idea is we want to be able to have the user input um, like a number, right? So we definitely need an input box. This is an input tag. You can define that on your page in HTML. And you can give that input an ID because we're going to need that ID to get uh, to kind of get it later on using JavaScript. So I'm just going to give it an ID of like a uh, grade. <clears throat> I'll call it numeric grade. And go ahead and save that and make sure that this shows up here. I also need to remember that my face is like might be blocking some of this code, so I'll try to keep that in mind. Let's go ahead and go down to the console, zoom in a little bit, zoom this in a little bit. Maybe let's add a title here called like grade converter. All right, so the, again, the idea is they could type in like 95, click a button like enter, and then that'll tell you if you got an A, a B, or C, or a D. So this is going to be good practice for like conditional logic because you're going to be doing a lot of like if statements probably. So let's just go ahead and build a button here. Button is another HTML tag you can use to kind of have a button show up on the page. And inside of that button, you can actually nest some text. So inside this, I'm going to say like convert. Go ahead and save that. I don't know why it keeps thinking that I need to translate this page. There we go. All right, so if you want to apply like JavaScript to a page, um, you can just put a script tag at the bottom of your index file, like right before the end body tag. That's one way to do it. You can also import it at the top and do some like async deferred on load stuff, but let's just put it at the bottom of this script. And what we want to do is we want to base basically get the value of the input when the user typed in. So in order to do that, you have to use the document global object. And that has a method called get element by ID. And you can simply pass in the string of the ID that you're looking for. And so in this case, we're looking for the numeric grade. We're looking for this input box. So we can get it like this. And I like to put those in constants. So I'm going to say const um, numeric equals to that. If I can kind of collapse this a little bit. This monitor is a little bit smaller than the other one, so I don't really have as much real estate. Maybe I gotta zoom out. Is that too small for you all if I zoom out? <clears throat> anyway, so yeah, we are gonna get the numeric like this. And every time I make little changes in JavaScript, especially if you're a beginner, just print out everything along the way. Just make sure that stuff is working. 
that we actually print out and see that we have an input grade down here. And we, we, we need to um, basically listen for when the user clicks on convert. We need to take that numeric grade, run it through maybe like a conditional if else statement and print out the letter grade. So how do you do that? Well, on the button itself, you can add an on-click listener or you can add an event listener down here. It's kind of up to you how you want to do it. People say that doing inline on clicks aren't good, um, but I don't think it's a big deal. So let's just define a function over here called like convert. And when someone clicks on this button, we can basically just say call the convert function. So we have a function here called convert. You click the button, it invokes that function. And we are going to basically put that console log inside that convert function just to verify that this is working. So if I put like 80, the convert, we see a console log. So we're kind of, we kind of know that this works. <laughs> now the next step is how do we actually get the value 85 from this input box? Well, what you could do is you can do const, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put this into a variable so we can use it later. But I'll say const value is equal to numeric dot value. All right, dot value is a property that exists on input DOM elements. And you can basically print that out here. Let me take a step back and just look at the chat and see if anyone's asking questions or anything. <clears throat> All right, I got a couple of people on the stream. So welcome to the stream, y'all. If you have any questions while I'm doing this, like feel free to ask. I'll stop and just explain stuff. Or if you have a... Uh, Another idea of like what I could build in this live stream, let me know. There's nothing, I'm not doing anything strict in this stream. I'm just kind of like doing whatever. So welcome, hopefully this is helping you all learn. If this is too easy, let me know. Like I always struggle with how hard of content should I make versus how easy should it be? Like is this stuff super, super easy for you all? Or are you all actually getting something from this? If you're getting something from it, I'll keep doing it. All right, so printing out 85, that is how you get the actual numeric value that was inside the input box. Now, one thing I like doing is I like naming my variables to kind of describe what it is. Like, since we're not using TypeScript, it's hard to know like what this is. So I might put EL at the end of this to know that it actually is a DOM element. And that makes it a little bit easier to understand the code. That's just my convention. There's no like strict rule about that. Um, so now what we need to do is basically if the user typed in anything greater than 90, greater than or equal to 90, you need to print out A somewhere, right? So I'm going to, first of all, let's put a span somewhere so we can actually print out the grade. So I'll say like your grade, your letter grade is, all right, let's, let's do this. All right, that's really big. Let me zoom out a little bit. Oh, I didn't even close the H1 tag over here. That's why this text is so huge. I was wondering why that text was like gigantic. Um, just put a line break here. Let me make this as sloppy as possible. <clears throat> All right, so the idea now is when you click convert, I want to basically dynamically change NA to be something, right? I want it to be A, B, C, D. So just to show you, we can also grab that element because I gave this an ID of grade, I can say const grade L is equal to document dot get element by ID. Oops, why is my autocomplete doing the wrong one? So get the grade element, and then I'm gonna say grade L dot inner text is equal to Let's just go ahead and put value here just to verify this works. Now we don't really need a console log because if it works, we'll see that NA will change to whatever the user typed in here, okay? <clears throat> um, so while I'm doing that, I noticed that this, you can type whatever you want in here. Like we want this to be a number, right? So it turns out, by the way, is my head block in this code? If it is, let me know. Okay, I got some questions. I'll answer those right after I wrap this up. Um, all right, so I think on the input, there's actually a type attribute you can add, and I could say number. And I do believe you can say like min 
is zero and max is 100. So that'll prevent someone from typing in like an arbitrary large number, I thought. Maybe that's not how it works. I might have to Google that one. I'm pretty sure there's a way to do that. Maybe it's like range. Yeah, you should be able to use a min and a max to create a range of legal values. Now the question is, is does it take a string or does it take a number? You know, my laptop is lagging so bad right now. Let's see. <clears throat> yeah, they do it here. Um, number, min is one, max is five. Doesn't seem to work though. I guess it, it's for the, like this clicker, like it'll prevent you from going out of bounds there, but the user can actually type in something too big. Uh, but anyway, I mean, let's just give this some, all right, let's just continue. <laughs> anyway, so I click convert, that, that'll that change the span to 100 here. Let me zoom over. All right, um, and now what we need to do is basically make a big if statement to say like if the value is greater than 90, greater than or equal to 90, then we could basically just do this. All right, let's try this out and see if it works. I think there would be an issue because value, when you read something from um, the input inputs, the input elements, it's actually gonna give you back a string, I believe. So you have to cast that to a number. One quick hack is you could put a plus in front of this. Um, I think a more proper way is you could run it through parse int. <clears throat> Just keep that in mind that this is gonna crash, I think, if you don't provide a number. So let's do 100 and it'll print out A here. Let's do 90. Okay, so think to yourself, how do I do the other letter grades? Well, if you learned about if statements and else if statements, you could just simply do an else if. And then I'm gonna say a value greater than or equal to 80. All right, we'll just keep on going down this path of just doing all the different letter grades. Do a C here. I need to remember to get closer to the mic. I keep leaning back. So greater than 60 would be a D. Now the reason this works is because the if the first if statement executes, then none of the other if statements are gonna run. So that's why you can do like all this fallback logic. Let's see if that works. A, B, C, D, and F. Let's do like 90. Let's do 89. Let's do 80. Uh, 79. I'm going to test all the edge cases here. All right, that's basically how you do a grade converter where you can type in a numeric value and it gives you your letter grade. I don't know if this was too easy for you all. If this was useful at all, let me know. But let's go back to the questions. I saw a lot of questions about authentication and JWT and stuff. So I could expand this. Why wouldn't let me move this? Anyway. All right, let me scroll back up and see. So Design Code has said, can you make a video on refresh token on front end using React or plain HTML JavaScript in detail on how to refresh token after specific interval automatically without lagging features? I'm not sure what you mean with uh, this without lagging features. By the way, I do have some videos on my channel about tokens. I don't know if I have one about refresh tokens, but usually I'll just kind of verbally explain how this works. Usually on your back end, you have an endpoint that refreshes a token, right? So you'll send over a refresh token and that's going to send you back a new access token. 
Um, let me take a step back. So when you first log into your application, typically you're sent an ID token or a re um, there's so many different names for this stuff. When you first log into your app, your backend is going to give you an access token and a refresh token. Okay, so you have two tokens. The access token is supposed to only last for like five, 10 minutes. The refresh token can last for longer. We're talking like days. Um, <clears throat> uh, and the, the refresh token is something that you can keep sending back to the back end to get a new access token. So in your React app, what I've done in our application is we have a refresh token that lasts 30 days. And we have an endpoint where when we hit it and log in, it sends back an access token, but then it sets a refresh token in a cookie, like a secure HTTP only cookie. So then later we have another endpoint called like refresh. And if you do a post request to that endpoint, your browser sends over that refresh token in the cookie. And then your API is going to process that cookie, look at it, and then send over an access token. So in your UI, all you have to need to do is just set like, the, the, the quickest hack is to set like a five minute timer, a five minute interval, and just keep on hitting that refresh endpoint. And just make sure that the interval runs before your ID token potentially times out. A more elegant solution is you basically, if you're using like Axios, you can add an interceptor to all your requests so that when you make a request to a backend and the backend throws an error saying that your token is expired, you can have Axios automatically hit that refresh endpoint get a new token and then retry your request again. I don't really like that approach because I don't like hitting your back end and watching it fail and then like retrying. It seems kind of dirty to me. I'd rather have the UI know like your token's about to expire. So just have your Re React UI just refresh it before, like five, 10 minutes before it expires. Um, but yeah, I mean, later on, maybe I could make a video about that. I'm kind of trying to focus on vanilla JavaScript videos lately just because I think they're useful for like beginners but yeah I could try to make a video on this I'll make a, a note all right let's see the Corey saying I'm trying to make a career change well I wish you luck in coming over to web development or programming how much do you know Corey like this little thing I showed you are the couple of videos I posted recently on my channel where I just do like simple JavaScript web apps. Are these useful? Like, are these above your skill level or are these like below your skill level? Um, like, what do you know about programming now? What are you trying to do? What are your goals? The design code is said JWT refresh token, I mean above. Yeah, I mean, so I think I, hopefully I explained that correctly. And if not, let me know. <laughs> Tina, these new computers cost so much money. I mean, is this this is my stream sound good? I mean, this computer is working pretty fine. Other than it's a little laggy, but if my audio is still good and my video quality still looks good, like this is cool. All right, design coded. Okay, so going back to that JWT refresh token question, without signing out. Yeah, so I mean that this the the approach I explained works without signing them out, right? You have your access token that you're storing somewhere in your front end code. It's usually in memory. And when you hit that refresh endpoint, it's gonna send you back a new access token. So all you do is you just replace the one you currently have in your code with the brand new fresh token. And then every future request that you make should have that new fresh token. So you don't have to log the user out to kind of update the new access token. <coughs> Corey Snyder said, what are some good projects to have on your portfolio as a front-end dev? Um, in my opinion, like after you've gotten a good handle on building all these like smaller little projects, like building larger applications are really just built up of these smaller little um, problems, right? So like for an example, how do you read from an input box? How do you make a button submit? How do you make stuff dynamically displayed to a page? All that you can kind of get a good handle on using these like small projects. And you could put this on your portfolio if you want, just to kind of show people that you've been practicing. But ultimately, in my opinion, if you're gonna have a portfolio and you're a beginner, 
I'd much rather see you have like a really big project, like a project that you've been investing like a couple of months in, right? So you have like 10, 20, 30 different pages. You're hitting like different back and endpoints. You're doing authentication. You're doing authorization. Maybe you have like different role based authorization. And all that might sound really advanced. But I mean, that's the point. You need to show people that you actually know what you're doing. So <clears throat> let me take a drink. Hold on. But even like a, going back to Corey Snyder's question about this, <clears throat> if you did like a clone project, I think that's a good, good project as well. I think it's more important to build something that's kind of unique for your interests. Like if you like playing League of Legends, like try to build an application that can help multiple League of Legends players log in, do something, maybe track their statistics, be able to print out PDF charts of like their growth of a player. <clears throat> sorry um if you like sports or football build an application that allows other people to create an account log in do something with football do something with soccer i don't know whatever you like doing but if you make it geared towards your hobby or interest it's easier during an interview to kind of talk about it because you're more passionate about it versus you're like oh yeah i just made a facebook clone that's like you might not be there might not be as much passion behind that when you're explaining it to people so yeah, I don't know. I don't know how to answer this. I can't give you like an actual specific idea, but I just pick pick a bigger project and just keep on adding to it every day. Like every day, spend 30 minutes, add a new feature. And then after a month, you're going to actually have like a nice looking project. I'd rather see that than a project that has like, or I'd rather see that than a portfolio that has like 100 of these little play apps, I guess. All right. <clears throat> Design code says also some people set the token refresh token in header itself, some storing in DB. It's confusing at the moment. Some use cookies with HTTP secure. Yeah, I mean, the most secure way is to store your refresh token in HTTP secure. Your refresh token is the most important thing to make sure you do not leak that because if you leak it, someone has a long living token that they can just keep on hitting your endpoints to get back an access token. And then they can hit your app for like days doing whatever they want. If you leak the actual access token, it's not that big of a deal because it only lasts for five to 10 minutes, right? So it's, it's more important to make sure that your refresh token is probably in a secure HTTP only cookie. Um, <clears throat> but ultimately it all boils down to like cross-site scripting. So if your application is safe and secure from cross-site scripting, Meaning like you're not bringing in some random jQuery scripts directly in your head here. Like if your application has a bunch of random scripts that you're bringing in when the page loads, you're probably very vulnerable to cross-site scripting. You want to make sure that you're using a bundler. All that code is being pulled on a specific lockdown version that you know doesn't have security vulnerabilities. And if you want to get more advanced, you need to have your own private NPM registry where all those packages have been like downloaded and cached so that you know when you do an npm install you're not installing a bunch of like bad code i guess <laughs> but if you're just doing this to learn like it, just don't worry about this stuff um a lot of people get caught up on like what is the best way to do this stuff and it's like if you're just trying to learn how to code something or build a really small application for yourself like don't worry about the security stuff it's not that critical that you get it right because no one's going to use your application anyway <clears throat> I gotta clear my throat, man. <clears throat> All right, sorry, I'm trying to catch up with these. Sometimes I talk too much with these questions, but hopefully that's cool. All right, let's scroll back up. Some people, yeah, yeah. Design coded, I would definitely go to Dennis Ivey's YouTube channel. I think he has a video where he does exactly this. He like sets up an Axios interceptor and does all this logic that you're looking for. If you want something now, if you want something in the future, I can't guarantee I'll make you a video within the next couple weeks about this. But if I get time to make a JWT refresh flow video, I can explain it with interceptors. But for right now, I'm sure you know who Dennis Ivey is. 
go to YouTube, type in Dennis Ivy, look through his videos, find he has a JWT uh, interceptor video, I believe. What's up, Ujal? Uj Ujawal? Ujawal. It's always good to see people keep coming back to my streams. Let's see. Axiite G. I don't know if I pronounced that right. How do you display nested JSON responses from an API? Um, I would need to have an example of what you mean. A nested JSON response. So you don't mean like an array, right? So an array that has a bunch of nested objects in it. You're talking, I don't know. You have to send me a link to an example, like put it in a GitHub gist or send me a link to the JSON you're talking about because I don't really know what you mean here. Unless you're talking about like recursion, like a nested, like you have a, like if you imagine like a file system, you have a folder and inside that folder you have folders and inside that folder you have more folders. Is that what you mean by a nested structure? Where you have like very similar um, objects that are nested inside of objects and it just keeps going down. If you're trying to do that, you need to do some type of recursion usually and it makes it really easy to just like display them. But you need to make sure that the stuff is nested very similar to how we do like HTML. Like you'd have to have a div and then inside that div, like depending on your recursion and how many elements are nested, you'd have to have like more divs or more elements, depending on what you're trying to do. Uh, let's see if I can do this. This is not gonna be a good uh, description of what you want, but <clears throat> like here's an example, like if you have an array of folders, actually no, let's do, let's just say you have like a node and that node has children. And this would have one, two, three children, right? So you need three different objects here. So one, two, three. And then this one happens to have one nested child. So this, is this what you mean by nested JSON response from the API where you have like this type of format? Because this ultimately you have to have it like print out kind of like this in a sense. If you wanted to, there's other ways you can do it depending on what you're trying to do. Going on here yeah i don't know how to answer your question also i'm sorry let me just move on so abdu Poder, what projects i'm not sure is that a question corey says yes for sure the basics html css and just starting on javascript tina says yeah it sounds good the video looks good are you in the living room tina are the girls still sleeping all right Ujal says, even I am thinking of switching my career like I am still in college from development technical to product and management. Yeah, I mean, it's a completely different like field. It's still in tech kind of, but it's, it's a different field. Um, I, I don't think I'd enjoy doing project management or product management. I don't like meetings. And I, that's, you're going to be doing a lot of meetings, talking to people all the time. But if that's what if you like doing that, then yeah. I think that's a good field to go to. I like the more technical stuff, like how do you get applications? How do you scale them? How do you build them? But do what you enjoy. If you have the opportunity, then just work and learn on, learn on what you want. All right, Corey Snyder, I have a BS degree in IT web, web dev, but graduated over four years ago. I'm behind on the tech. <clears throat> um, yeah, so what... Did you just not decide to get a job or was it too hard to get a job after you graduated? I guess I'm confused why you say you're behind on the tech. If you've, you got a degree in IT, um, so are you working right now? Or are you just maybe stuck on an old legacy project where you're doing like PHP work or something? Cool. Awesome. Glad to hear that stream's still good. Oh, wait, let me go to live chat instead of top chat. I don't know if that matters. All right, I'm, I'm trying to get caught up. Let's see. Sir also, design code is, says, Sir also beginner struggling in making carousel that's dynamic and responsible for any sizes without counting and setting in if statements. Yeah, that one's a hard one. I'm not really versed with like 
CSS and like styling and making something look really nice. Like I try to stay away from those type of tasks at work or just stay away from it in general because I could spend like an hour with, if you don't have a designer, you could literally spend like days trying to perfect something that might look good, right? The difference with that and coding is that once this works, you're done. You know it works. It does the exact logic that you need it to do and you can move on to something else. But when it comes to like styling and making stuff be responsive and look nice on different devices, it's just a lot of tedious work and it like never seems like it ends. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't... Carousel. What is a carousel? Is that the the image slider or something that just continuously shows new images on a periodic uh, interval? I think you can get away a with using like Flexbox for a lot of stuff these days, but yeah, I mean, I would probably also just use a third party library if you can, unless you're trying to actually like force yourself to learn how to do some of the stuff. There's a lot of carousel libraries that kind of do like what you probably want. Music and guitar. I'm not sure if I got a promotion at my current job and got complacent. Yeah, Corey, what what do you work in? I know you said IT, but like, what is your tech that you're using? You might think it's outdated, but it might not be outdated unless you're doing like COBOL or something. But even PHP, I think, is a nice language you can learn and build stuff with. So just keep that in mind when you say your tech stuff is outdated. It's I think if you're on social media too much and you're on Twitter all the time, you're on YouTube, you might think that you're way behind in tech, but really all this stuff is just a lot of hype. There's tons of jobs out there where you don't need to know um, Next.js. You don't need to know um, Svelte <clears throat> or this new one that came out remix that everyone's going to hype over for the next month. Like I'm not looking forward to all the videos that keep on showing up about remix, the newest, greatest React framework. It's just another framework that Hopefully just uh, blows over. <laughs> if is very low on performance. I'm not sure what that statement is for. Corey said just trying to get hired in this field. Oh wait, so you are you working in music and guitar and you're trying to get hired as an IT person? Maybe I'm like not... I'm kind of far behind with what you're saying. Let's see. Brian says, how would you add the same class to multiple elements? Trying to add a border to three different images. Click red button, add red border, blue button, adds a blue border. <clears throat> how would you add the same class to multiple elements? Yeah, so let's let's just try that. I mean, I do, I do want to help people with coding instead of just answering questions all the time, but let's try building that. Keep on asking questions if you have them, and I'll try to answer them in a second. But Brian is asking, how would you add the same class to multiple elements? So he has three different images. Let's find an image of something. Um... Just do like a StarCraft image or something. Yeah, sure, this one's good. All right, copy image address. And let's go ahead and do source of that. And I'm gonna say width of just 40 so it like won't go off the page. There we go. Okay, maybe a little bit bigger than that. So he's saying that he has three images. And he has a button that says like red, um, blue or something. By the way, Tina, I think um, UPS is dropping off that formula at the door. <clears throat> Yo, is it, if my head blocks the code, like just let me know. Maybe I should move my head. Let me just do that real quick. How do I do that? I just don't want it to, uh, I need to get a, a key binding set up, but I'm just too uh, lazy to do it. So I can click a button and have it like switch over. 
All right, so hopefully my head is blocking now the debugger down here, which we're not going to use, hopefully. But I think he's asking, like, if I click on the red button, I want to add a red border to all these images. So what you could do, I'm just going to add an image class to all these. You could add whatever class you want, but I think it might make it easier if you do that. So when you click on, let's say, the red button, I'm going to call a function called like set border and I'm going to pass in the string of red. Okay, so when we have that clicked, we're going to call a function called set border. This is going to take in a color and what we want to do is we want to grab all the DOM elements that have a class of image. So I could say const images is equal to document dot query selector all I believe. And I'm going to do a class of image. So that should hopefully give you back an array of like three images, which you should be able to loop over. There might be a different way to do it. Uh, let me just try this. <clears throat> let me just see if that, when I click it, it prints out three images. Uh oh. Okay, so this works. Does that make sense so far? You have three images. They all have a class of image on it. When you click on the red button, we, we grab all three of those images from the DOM, and now we're looping over them so we can do something to it. So in this case, what we could do is for e every image, we could say image dot, I think it's style dot border color, and then we could say color here. <clears throat> we might also need to do like, um, some border size. I don't remember this off the top of my head. I might have to Google this. Is it border size? Hmm. Okay, well, let, let me just do a quicker fix because this is something I actually know how to do. So instead, it's just to make a style called red. Red border. Yeah, no, never mind. Let me, let me go back. Let me go back. I want to figure out how to do this. Image, style, border color, border size. Um, JavaScript, DOM, style, border, color. I thought that's how you do it, but we shall find out. Okay, you just do this. Okay, that makes sense. There's always like a thousand different ways to do the same thing in every language, so. <clears throat> I think, it's, okay, so it's just border. And then I could put that text in. Let me let my PC kind of catch up with me. It's starting to get a little laggy. So instead of thick, I'll do like one pixel. Okay, whatever, I'll keep it as thick. But let's interpolate that color. If I haven't just completely lost you all and confused you all jumping around screen, um, screens. But we're going to interpolate the color that was passed into this function here. If I click it, it adds the border red to all the images that are on the page. Um, and I could do the same thing for this one over here. So I could just go ahead and put an on-click listener. I could change this to blue. And now I can switch between blue and red. I don't know if that's the question you're asking, but that's how I interpreted it. And that's how you can basically achieve what you want. So let me know if that answers your question, whoever asked that. Oh, Brian. So Ujawal asks, can you suggest some good DevOps courses? Like I want to learn more about CI CD tools and frameworks. Dang. Um, I really don't know that many. I don't really watch that many DevOps courses. At my work, they signed me up for like a, it's called A Cloud Guru. Let me show you this. This is what they uh, gave me a subscription for at work because they want me and someone else to kind of review this learning platform and to give our company feedback for an Amazon course. But so far the course I'm taking like, it's not that good, mainly it's because I already know a lot about Amazon and um, 
like a, a lot of the different services that Amazon provides and how, how to use them. But this one's super expensive, like 209 per year. Okay, well that maybe, let me go to monthly. 35 a month, it's kind of expensive, but I mean, if you really wanna learn DevOps, you could check out this um, A Cloud Guru. They have a lot of stuff just about DevOps specifically, I believe. Let me see what they got. Courses. Platforms, AWS. So it looks like they have 100 videos on AWS. They got some stuff on Azure, Ansible, Chef, Docker. So really I think a better question you should ask yourself is what specifically in DevOps do you want to learn? Focus in on that, get good at that first and find resources that kind of teach you that topic. So for an example, I would maybe start with Docker. Docker is a tool that's used for kind of containerizing your code. And it's really important to understand if you're kind of getting into the DevOps field these days. So I would say find some tutorials on Docker, maybe try YouTube first. If those don't help you learn what you need to learn, you could check out Udemy. I don't know if there's any good Udemy Docker courses. I'm sure there are. Just so you can kind of get a good understanding. But honestly, the um, the best way to learn these things is just play around with them and read the docs. Like most of these courses are just going to be people reading through the docs and then they make a tutorial about them reading through the docs and kind of explain it to you. So if you can just bypass that middleman of someone explaining these concepts to you and you can just go straight to the docs and learn them yourself, you could save some money and just do that. And I think it's going to put you at a better level because now you can actually like break down the documents and kind of learn them. Okay, remove, hide this user. Every time I do a stream, this guy shows up. But yeah, sorry to answer your question. I don't really know a good, um, a really good resource. Check this one out. Subscribe for a month. It's 35 bucks. Try to watch as many videos as you can. See if it's useful. If not, cancel your subscription. And then leave me a comment below if you have a, a suggestion of what you should do for DevOps courses. <laughs> By the way, if you haven't liked this video yet, be sure to click that like button because it helps my channel grow and it helps my... Uh, let me move this over. Helps this live stream get more popular, I believe. Is my head good over here? I should just check myself instead of asking. All right, let's go over and check. Oops, let me turn off preview because this eats up CPU. All right, so Brian, did that answer your question? Yeah, that's the first thing that came to mind is just use classes. Like you could add like a red border class. And then basically what you could do is when you first call this function, just remove all classes. Let me zoom over. So if you're going to do it with classes, I would say this. Every time this function gets invoked, just remove all the classes. I'll remove all those extra like decorating classes and then add the single class. So like this could be class instead and you could have passed in like red border here. You could have passed in blue border and class is a reserve word so let me change that. And instead I could have said like image dot class list dot add. I could have done that. So same approach, you loop through all the images, you add that one specific class, but the main difference is now what you need to do, uh, oh yeah, let's do it here. You need to remove all these other classes. So let's say you had like a red border, you gotta remove that one, remove blue border. That would be the easiest way to do it. And maybe you could have like a const of borders. So have an array of different borders, um, blue border. And then what you could do is just loop through it. So like borders dot for each border and just do this. Does that make sense? This is how I would do it if I was doing classes. It really depends on how many, I guess there's like a min size I can minimize this to. But yeah, I would, if you're doing classes, I'd do something like this. But scroll back up, see if we lost anybody or lost any questions. 
So Corey asks, how did you get your start? I'm joining your channel a couple of weeks ago from Coding After 30. Uh, I went to college and got a computer science degree. So that's kind of where I started. I was even coding before that in high school. Like there's a couple of like learn Java classes, which I enrolled in. So I started learning in high school. And then even before that in middle school, I was dabbling with um, just like really simple programming stuff. Like I don't think I actually understood what I was doing, but I would try to like make scripts for Half-Life mods. Um, which really meant I was just copying code and pasting it and hoping it worked. But that's kind of where I started. And then high school I got more serious about it because I learned Java and how to do like object-oriented programming and stuff like that. I tried to build like a multiplayer um, small little game in high school where I had like sockets going in Java and we could have like characters moving around the same server. And then in college you did comp I did computer science and just kind of kept learning and then got a job and then just Every day just been coding. <clears throat> okay, cool. Corey says, I'm not in the tech field at all. I'm an operations manager for an engine company. That sounds cool. Well, I shouldn't say that because you're trying to switch careers, so maybe it's not as cool as it sounds. But, but yeah, operations manager sounds like a completely different career than being a programmer. So I wish you luck. I hope you find programming a lot more enjoyable than what you're doing now. Hun is asking, have I tried Remix.js? I have not tried it. I'm kind of going to wait for the hype to die down, and then I can read articles about it to see if it's actually good. But from what I understand, Next.js does like most of everything you need. I'm not sure why you need Remix.js, but maybe it has some benefits. Um, I think I just have a biased opinion against Kent. <laughs> like He's probably a cool guy, but... This whole idea of like integration tests first, unit tests, don't write unit tests, I don't like is a paradigm there. So I have like a, a biased opinion about him. But maybe his framework is cool. I need to check it out. I'm trying to answer your questions as fast as you ask them. If you did, how was it? No, I, I haven't tried Remix, so I don't really know how it works. Why don't you use jQuery? It's faster with little code written. Um... The reason I don't use jQuery in my tutorials is because I want people to understand like the lower level vanilla JavaScript. You do have a point though, jQuery helps write code faster. Um, a lot of people hate on jQuery, but uh, when I first started coding like with HTML web-based tech, I use jQuery all the time and it really does help. Like doing all this extra stuff, it's like, for example, I could just do this. It looks nicer, it's cleaner, it's easier to understand, and it grabs me all of the images, all the DOM elements that have an image class. Versus this, kind of a pain, but honestly, if you just wanted to keep on using vanilla JavaScript, you could just make like a helper function, like this, and then you have your jQuery equivalent. So, um, but yeah, a lot of people hate on jQuery. I don't know why, maybe it's because it's just bloated or something, but I don't see any issue with using jQuery. And in fact, if I was actually building like vanilla JavaScript applications, I would probably still use jQuery because it does help with a lot of stuff. Or he says, can you find a junior dev job just knowing HTML, CSF, and JavaScript? I think it's possible. You probably won't get paid that much, but I think you could find a, a job where maybe your main role is taking like designs that a designer gives you and like building out web pages for those designs. But again, I'm not, I don't really know the landscape of like the job market. I know like coding after 30 and uh, coding phase is kind of, that's more of their like niche i guess is that they know more of like the job market i just want to teach people how to code so whether or not this what i'm teaching you gets you a job is not really important i just want to make sure that you understand the logic behind what you're writing because that's going to ultimately give you a job if you know how to write the logic and you understand the coding and the problem solving all the rest will just come but i want to say yes i think you could probably find one it might be kind of hard but you have a lot of experience in a engineering or at a company as an operations manager, like you have four years of experience. So you're already like 
a professional and you're just trying to switch careers. So I think it's going to be a lot easier for you to find a job than it is for someone who's coming fresh out of like college or for someone who's trying to learn on their own because you have like that actual work work experience. Assuming that you're working full time, you know. See how long has this stream been going for? Does it tell me? Oh, 50 minutes. Okay. <clears throat> but yeah, is this, uh, if this stream is helping you all out, be sure to give me a like. And if you're new, give me a subscribe. I'm assuming everyone watching is a subscriber. All right, Sheldon says, could we write tests, for example, on Amazon, you add two items and a promo must be applied. If it's not, it fails. <laughs> could we write tests, for example, on Amazon? <laughs> I'm not sure what you're asking here. Are you talking about unit tests? Could we write tests? So when I hear the keyword test, I'm thinking integration tests, unit tests. Um, but then you say on Amazon, you add two items and a promo must be applied. And if not, it fails. If you could break down that question, I'm not, I'm not too sure. I want to help you out, but I'm not sure what you're asking. All right, Akash says, I'm stuck with CSS problems since two days. <laughs> What's up, Akash? Yeah, CSS sucks. <laughs> I've spent many, many time, many hours fiddling with CSS to get stuff working. And that's why I much rather do back-end engineering or DevOps engineering because it's a lot more enjoyable to me than front-end engineering. But um, I think a lot of people are trying to get into the industry and front-end engineering is like the, the I don't want to say the easiest way to get in, but it's like there's a lot more resources to get in through that path. So. <clears throat> yeah keep the questions coming if you all have more questions or you want me to try to just work on my next thing i have like a couple of other things that i was going to try doing on a live stream like rock paper scissors might be fun but whoa what's this all right so Ujo Wall says, thanks, bud. Always great to converse virtually thousands of miles away, but still sharing good knowledge. Yeah, thanks for joining. Hopefully I can help you out with my uh, answers. So Mox Burr, BR, sure, we'll take it, or we'll like it. Great tutorial. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Let's see. Corey says, yes, that's what I need. I solve a lot of problems at work, but I want to do it in tech. Let's see, can JS be used as a backend language? Uh, yeah, we actually, at my job, we use Node.js, which is a runtime that interprets JavaScript to run your servers. So yeah, you can use JavaScript for your backend language. And I personally like using that because now it's really easy if you're a full stack developer, you can work on the front end and work on the back end and not have to do that context switching of like, oh, now I have to remember how do I write Go syntax or how do I write JavaScript syntax? It's just, it's the same across the board. Or he says, I think working in web dev will be great for our family. Yeah, I mean, just keep on, keep on trying to learn it. And I think, I don't know, if you have a portfolio link, send it to me. I'm sure you could, I could look at it and see if, just keep joining my streams and keep, uh, join my Discord as well if you want to ask me questions about trying to get into the industry. I don't know how much I can help you. Again, my focus is on just trying to teach you how to code. Um, I'm not really good at giving like career advice, but Anise says, is it standard way of using jQuery in React JS? <clears throat> um, I don't think you should be using jQuery in React JS, if that's what you're you're asking. I don't think there's any need to use jQuery in React. <laughs> Alright, so I got to the <clears throat> No, I don't really do private mentorships. I mean, you could just ask me questions on Discord and I'll like reply to you or I can like try to try to guide you as to like what you should work on or like what your project should be next or something. But yeah, I mean 
I don't do any like private mentor mentorships or anything. <clears throat> All right, so if no one has any more questions, I'll just continue on with working on one of these things. I guess showing tabs dynamically is something that's really simple. I can kind of show you that real quick. Oops. I have problems in styling select elements in HTML. Can you help? Can you style select elements? I don't even know. Yeah, I can try to help. Let's see. Let us try to answer that question. So if we have a select and we have some options, um, let us see if this works. Is this how you do it? There's some DOM elements and tags that I have to keep on Googling. Like I don't use selects that many that, that often. Uh, yeah, so how do you find my Discord? Go to, it might be in the description of the stream. If it's not, go to my actual channel, like on YouTube. And then there's like three icons in the top right near my big banner. There should be a link to my Discord. It's just like a globe, like a gray globe. And there might be a link to... That might be the only link. I don't... I, don't, I deleted Twitter. I'm tired of tech, tech Twitter. It's just crazy. Um, or you can just go to my... Uh, you know, let me just check. Why am I telling you to do something? Let me just go look. Yeah, so I have a newsletter, which I don't even know why I have that. <laughs> I got my GitHub link, and then I have my Discord link. So if you were to click on this and uh, copy link, I'm going to go ahead and try to send it to you. Yikes. Okay, that's a big link. Um, hopefully that works. I sent the link in the actual thing. Okay. Rapunzel says it's in the stream description. So yeah, you can also just go to my stream and click the description. Let's see. <clears throat> okay, so this is how you do options. See, even as like a person who's been in the industry for a while, like you always have to kind of Google to remember like how you do stuff. Like I don't even remember how to do a select box because it's not like you're doing this every day. Like you'll have maybe one page out of 20 where you need to have a select box. But the rest of the time is spent on doing some other stuff that's not related to a select. So after like two months of never seeing a select, you have to remember how to do a select again. So you go and you Google it. Um, but let's see. So we have a select box, but it's not showing anything because I call it options, not option. So what are you trying to style? Because I think you can style the actual like select box here, but I don't think you can style the drop down. I'm probably completely wrong on that, but Let's just see what we can do. Let's play around with this. So I'm going to say for the select boxes, let's try giving it some padding and see what happens. Okay, so you can give it padding. And you change the font size. <clears throat> you can change the font size. And you change this drop down caret. Um, I don't know. What are you trying to style about it? Like, are you trying to style the drop down? Sometimes it's not good to like change the styling on some of these things because due to accessibility, like there's a certain way that the browser wants it to be displayed. And if you start modifying it, it might actually affect the user experience. Um, but Hey, 
Like if you wanted to hide the arrow, how do you hide the arrow? Stack overflow, hide arrow on select drop down. <clears throat> MS expand. So we might have to go look at a list of pseudo elements. It looks like there's different things you can apply to the select to change what it does. Okay, that didn't do anything. Copy and paste some code, see what it does, learn from it, and then forget it the next day. That's the best way to learn how to code. Okay, that's how you delete the uh, the arrow. Now, which one of these actually did that? Right, so it's always, this is something I definitely recommend you do as a beginner. Do experimental learning, comment code out, add code that you don't know what's going to do. See what happens when you actually comment it out. So this is like the main thing. I don't know if this other stuff was for. Maybe it was for like moving it over. I don't think you actually need that. Yeah, I guess on a WebKit, you just do appearance of none and that'll get rid of the arrow. But yeah, I'm not sure what you're trying to do. Like, what are you trying to style about it? Are you trying to actually style these elements here? Sometimes you actually can't. You have to build your own dropdown. <clears throat> What's up, CD Music Group? Oh, cool. Okay, so thanks. Let me let me go to my Discord. Make sure that you're in here. You know, I have to log in and stuff. Let me just do that later. But yeah, cool. I'll try to message you on Discord when I get a chance. The so Lakshman says, "Hello. Do you have any tips on improving the?" Personal portfolio design. Um, what is your personal portfolio design? If you send the link, I could try to like look at your page and give you feedback. But again, I'm not a designer. I'm not a, a user experience person. I'm not a graphic designer. So I can't really give you that much feedback. I could just tell you if it looks bad or if it looks good. But um, yeah. So let's see, when making pages responsive, how many categories do you consider? I only do two categories below 768 and above 768. <clears throat> I mean, again, I'm not a front end expert, but I would follow the conventions that other libraries use, like bootstrap breakpoints. Usually there's like four or five. There's like extra large, large, medium, small, um, here. These are the breakpoints that are inside of Bootstrap. And a lot of other libraries do a very similar like convention where they'll have different breakpoints. Now you can change these to be whatever you want, but <clears throat> they've kind of, I think, distilled all the different possible widths of um, devices and gave you like a good solution. So I would say try to follow these breakpoints if you want but again there's no hard or fast rule like you can just do whatever you want make it look good for the what you're trying to do but just i would also like go and look at device widths like i'm sure there's like a graph of like average uh web device width <coughs> excuse me like maybe they have an actual like Mm, let me look at a histogram. Let's see if this gives us what we want. What is this? Um, website. Monitor average monitor with Instagram. 
Yeah, I don't know. There's probably a better way to find this. But really, I mean, just follow Bootstrap. Do these break points. And I think you'll be, uh, you'll be good. You'll be in a good position and making a, a nice looking website. <clears throat> yeah, Akash, if you, um, have you seen some of these other like really basic HTML things I've been building? Like if this, if you go back and watch like my, I think I call it beginner JavaScript practice videos. I would recommend watching through those. They're pretty short. They're like five, 10 minutes. Watch through a couple of them and let me know, are you able to do it yourself? Let me rephrase that. Try to do it yourself. Like I think I start the video off 30 seconds. I show you what we're going to build. Pause the video, build out for yourself. Like don't watch the entire video. Just pause it and build out the entire thing yourself. If you're stuck on any of that stuff, then I would just continue to build out these small little like widgets. So try to understand logic. And then also in the stream, I think I also built like a um like a, a grade converter. Go back, rewind the stream, find where I did the grade converter and look at the the end result. Pause the video and try to build the grade converter yourself. These are some of the things that you have to figure out how to build yourself. And if you can't do it yourself, like if you have to watch me do it for you, you're not going to be able to improve your logic. Like you actually need to sit down and spend time like trying to figure out how to build these things. <clears throat> All right. Anyone have any more questions or anything? What is the CSS problem you're stuck on, Akash? I won't be able to help you, but I'm just curious. <laughs> or David, do you have any um any questions? Are you familiar with the code mirror library? I've used it like once or twice. We could just play around with that since I don't know what else to really do on the stream right now. Um let's go and go to like CDNJS and try to find code mirror. Let's see. Here are the styling. I mean, did you, did you have a specific question about how you use Code Mirror, or do you just want me to watch me like play around with it? How do you do this? Do you need the JavaScript? I'm sure you do. All right, so let's do a link to CSS, and let's just go ahead and paste in that Code Mirror site. And let's also do a link to the JavaScript. So script source, link to the JavaScript. So now we should have code mirror accessible to us. And I think like, if I scroll down, I think it's pretty easy to get going. You just have to like make like a, a pre tag or something. And then you have to like say code mirror init. This will be a learning experience for all of us. Okay, so we're importing some external third party libraries. And then you may have to install like one of these themes, maybe. Anyway, let's go to the code mirror docs. So what are we doing right now? We're trying to set up code mirror. Okay, so I'm, someone asked if I'm familiar with it. And I've used it at one point. Let me go back. Basic usage, include the script tag, include the style sheet, include your JavaScript. What is mode, mode, okay. I might need to also include that. So for every language that you want to support, I think you have to include a mode. So let's do that as well. I'm gonna say script source of this. So that'll give me JavaScript support. And I believe you have to install every mode that you want, depending on what you're trying to do. Like they probably have one for like mode slash HTML. Okay. And then if you read through the docs, you do this. This will append an editor to your body, it says. So let's see what happens if we do that. 
doesn't do anything. Wait. No, there is something there. Cool. All right, so it's set up. Um, now, there might be a way to make this height be larger. Maybe you can do it with CSS. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. yeah, what is this called? Cold mirror scroll. Okay, well, I mean, it looks like it's working. Yeah, so what is your question? Because that's how you get it set up. I mean, do you have an actual question about code mirror? Because it seems like the, the syntax highlighting is working. I can def declare functions, and it's kind of like highlighting some keywords, highlighting strings. So this is all working for JavaScript. Do you have any questions, though? Let's see. Can you try to create a Java editor there? Yeah, let's go back and do that. So again, like... If you want to support different languages, you have to do uh, or Java. Ooh, you might be out of luck, man. There's no Java. How's there no Java? This has to be messed up. Pull in Java. Code mirror Java. Now you're going to make a code editor and not have Java. He's saying C like. Mm -hmm. How to set Java mode in code editor or code mirror? Text x hyphen Java. All right, let's just try that. Maybe that's how you do it. Um, but it looks like you do code mirror. You pass it the DOM element you want to kind of set up, and you can also pass it a mode. Let's do a mode of that. Line numbers of true. Copy everything else from Stack Overflow. But yeah, that should make the line numbers show up. That should look nicer. All right, let's see. Java. How do you do Java again? Public, static, void, main. Um, what is it? String arcs. System dot out dot print line. Hello world. Yeah, I don't think this is working. So we probably need to find text slash x Java for a mode. Really. Let me go to the chat. Maybe someone already knows. Nope. All right. So, okay. We're trying to get Java support. I'm typing some Java syntax here inside the code mirror editor. We're telling it mode text X Java. But then if you go to the actual like library, they don't have a Java here for some reason. So it's like, where is the actual Java stuff set up? There's probably, there's probably a default styling, like a package styling that you have to provide. Um, I see why you're asking now. It's actually harder than you think it would be. Okay, here we go. We got Java here as a mode. If you look at it, it's called mode C-like. So 
So now we go back and we go, I remember reading that somewhere. So we gotta make sure we bring in the C-like thing. And I'm gonna go ahead and bring that in. I think it's a script. So script source is mode of C-like. And then hopefully job will be syntax highlight. Oh crap, uh, public static void main. String of args. There we go, I think it's working. System.out. Print line. Hello world. Import system.star. I don't remember how to write Java, but I think this is looking good. Um, yeah, so that hopefully answers your question. Kind of recap, we just bring in the code mirror styling sheet, the CSS sheet, bring in the code mirror JavaScript, bring in the JavaScript mode if you want it to show JavaScript. But in this case, he's asking for Java. So it looks like you need to bring in something called C-like. And then when you set up your code mirror, you basically pass this. And you can also pass some other options as well if you want, but that's how you do it. All right, let's see. My chat with link is not appearing in your chat. Um, yeah, maybe there's a way to like turn on links or something. I should probably just join my Discord and log in. And then you could send me a link if you wanted to. I don't know if I remember my password though. And nor do I want you all to see my email, even though you could probably find it. You know, um, yeah, I don't know if you can find a way to send me a link or just type out like. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. <clears throat> Design coded how to make the div to behave inline block without changing display to block. <laughs> but it should behave like block level element, but its border should wrap exactly around the content and not on the whole space like block level. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to understand what you're asking. So you want a div to behave like inline block without changing the display of the block but it should behave like block level element, but its border should wrap exactly. So you're just trying to make a border around something that like, let's try this out y'all. Let's go, hopefully that answered your code mirror thing. I think it did. I'm just gonna close out of this stuff. <laughs> so I'm gonna make a div. That's my awesome text. And I'm going to give it a border. So inside the head, I can say style, border, border, one pixel, one pixel solid, red. All right, so this should have a border attached to it. And you're saying that the issue is, is that you don't want this border to go all the way to the right side of the page, right? You want it to end right here. That's, that's what you're asking. I mean, what I would recommend doing is don't use a div, use something else. Like this could be a span, but then you're saying, okay, well I need it to be block because I'm assuming you have some other stuff that needs to be on a new line. Well, what you could do is just wrap this in a div and that'll put it on a new line. I don't know if that's what you're asking. But that's what I would do. I would try to rearrange the HTML in such a way that like you have an inline block element with a border, but then you wrap that in a block element to push it all into a new line. Um, there might be a CSS style that you can prov provide to like make everything to the right of it just break. If that's what you're trying to do, but kind of what I would do. Does that answer your question?
Mm. Well, Hans says, thank you for your kind answer. Always when you build full stack app, do you work back in first, front in first? I did both ways, but I still find clever way. Um, I mean, it depends. I usually... I usually try to do the back end first because if you actually have endpoints that you can deal with creating and deleting and updating data, it makes it really easy for the front end to just directly connect to those back end endpoints and start doing some stuff. If you do the front end first, what you end up doing is you build a form and you get it all set up and like submit it somewhere, but then that doesn't actually do anything. So then you actually have to go and build the back end and then you have to go back to the front end and make sure it connects and it works. Um, but in most cases, it really depends on your project. Sometimes you have to do the front end first, and then you'll realize, oh, I need to refactor the back end a little bit so that it actually does what I need it to do. Hmm. Let's see. How much time do you recommend spending on a problem before Googling the answer? My solution sometimes gets so convoluted that I don't feel like I learn anything. I just get super frustrated. <clears throat> It depends on the problem. <laughs> I, I've i spent um, almost four or five days at work trying to solve a simple problem. And it turns out that on the back end, I was doing content type. But for some reason, Amazon expected it to be lowercase t content type. I spent five days trying to figure out why this wasn't working. Okay. Um, but I think after like the first couple, if you're a beginner, I think you need to spend like at least 30 minutes to an hour trying to solve stuff yourself. But if you are more advanced and you know that like, okay, this shouldn't be this hard, you can just go straight to Google and try to figure out if someone else has been like solving it. I think the problem is if you go to Google first, let me rephrase that. If you are too fast to go start Googling your questions, you're going to end up getting like thousands of different answers. And you're going to start going down paths that don't actually solve your problem. So you might end up wasting more time than if you just sat there trying to solve the problem yourself. But again, it depends on the solution. Um, sometimes what I like to do, because it sounds like you're getting solutions, but they're convoluted. So you're able to solve the problems, but you're just maybe writing some sloppy solution. It's always good to just basically delete all your code and start over. I've done that before where like I'll code a solution, I'll figure it out. But then I think the code looks pretty bad or it's like not elegant. So I'll literally just delete everything, take like a 10 minute break, 30 minute break and come back. And what ends up happening is you write much better code. You find different ways to f solve the problem that is more elegant, I guess. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Just make sure you do invest time trying to solve it yourself. Because I think a lot of people just go straight to YouTube tutorials to figure out their problems. They go straight to Stack Overflow to solve their problems. They copy code into their project. They have no idea what the code does, but they see that it fixes their issue and then they move on to the next problem. It's like, wait a second. You have no idea what that code does and you just copied it into your project. Spend like 10 minutes, 20 minutes reading through that code, understanding what it does so that later on, if you run into the same issue, you're not going to repeat the same problems. Lakshman says, what has happened to Mumble? I don't know. I kind of just burned, got burned down on that. Like the idea of open source is really cool and you have all these people working on a project, but you end up spending a lot of time managing things. Like I don't want to spend all this time reviewing PRs and helping people do their first commits and just um, telling people to fix like little bugs. So I just kind of abandoned it. I don't know. Um, I know Dennis moved on to other things as well, but I think it was fun while it lasted. It was a fun little project. I think some people got some good learning experiences from it, but I just didn't want to invest any more time in it just because it wasn't, I don't know. <clears throat> Akash says, this live teaches how to learn. That's awesome to see how you're searching things, playing around and learning along with. Yeah, thanks Akash. Yeah, this is, I honestly, the way I teach is the way I work. This is like the way you're seeing me do stuff is the same way that I work. So like I'll try to do something. If I know for a fact, I don't know the solution. I'll just Google it. Like the whole, when I was going back to the select options, like the select dropdown and how do you style it off the bat? I, do, I don't know. I, I do not know how to do that. So I went straight to Google because I knew I was going to waste time just trying stuff that's going to waste my time. 
but there's other stuff that I know I've done in the past and I know you can do and you can achieve. So I can just go straight to coding it because I know the solutions. <clears throat> One second. <clears throat> Everyone in my family has been fighting a cold and now like the mucus is like building up. It's getting hard to talk. <laughs> um... Lakshman with tech extension. Hopefully there's nothing bad on this site. All right, here we go. The Lakshman, Lakshman, Lakshman? Am I saying that right? Lakshman? I worked with someone um, whose last name was Lakshman before, or his first name was, I don't know. Welcome to my website. I am an undergraduate student in computer science field. I love building things using my knowledge. I love to learn about uh, new technologies. Um, I mean, it looks nice. Let's see. Let me let me try to full screen this. It won't let me move my. Uh, I guess there's like a max max or. Uh, yeah, there's like a min width of this. I can't shrink it anymore. Yeah, I mean, it looks good. I would maybe not say like my name is Lakshman again because you just set it up here. My name is Lakshman. Um, I'm an undergraduate student in information security engineering from India. I was introduced to programming in my pre-university. My first ever programming language is C++. I had studied C++ for almost two years in my pre-university. I am more familiar with JavaScript, Python, and Java programming languages. I have intermediate knowledge of web development and machine learning. Oh yeah, what machine learning do you do? Like what libraries have you done? And what, what techniques have you done? It'd be interesting to learn. I've learned React, React Native after my web development course. I learned Flask and used it to link the ML models to the web. Projects. Let's check out your projects. Oh, I guess you have a, a projects list. So let's see. Color name prediction. The color name prediction application with gets the color name of a particular region of the image. Let's check it out. Hopefully it's not CPU intensive. This better load Lakshman. I'll be disappointed if this doesn't load. It's not looking good, man. There we go. My internet just sucks. So, all right. So how does this work? Take an image from the user. When the user clicks on any part of the image, the RGB value of the pixel is stored and given to the pre-trained machine learning model. The model will take the RGB value and predict the color name. Oh yeah, let's try that. Come on, show up. Here we go. All right, let's click on something. Let's click on this red. Dark jungle green. Oh wow. Jet. Pistachio. That's pretty cool. I guess I'd be curious to know what what you use for your model. Yeah, I get the gist of that project. Let's see what's going on here. The data set contains 165 color names. You use K nearest neighbor. Cool, cool, cool. So is this, so I guess this is, um, is it really the algorithm? Basically you just, you provide a red, green, blue, and it just basically loops through all these, 
loops through the entire data set and finds the smallest difference. Like, does a red target subtracted red source? You'll get maybe like a, a difference. And then you can do like the square distance between them or something. I know you said use KNN, which is probably built into an actual like library, but I've always wanted to get into machine learning and co computer vision, but I just never really went down that path. This is a single digit recognition app. This is my first neural network project. At this point, we're not even doing anything with JavaScript. Like if you guys have questions, let me, let me go back and check, but I'm just checking out his profile because I'm actually interested in machine learning. When I get my portfolio done, minus the project, will you review it? Yeah, I'll review your projects in your portfolio. Oh, minus the projects. I can review it. Again, don't expect um, too much feedback because I'm not a d designer. Let's see what else I'm missing. Why can't you use drag and drop jQuery if the screen size is on mobile? I don't know how to answer that question. I don't really use jQuery that much. I haven't used it in like five or six years, so I don't know why it wouldn't work on mobile. Um, CD Music Group, I like to ask Design Coded a couple of questions to try and gain some clarity. What is it about block that you want to keep? Have you considered inline flex and flex wrap? Rapunzel says, thank you, very helpful. Lakshman says, you're spelling it perfectly. Corey says, as a beginner, how should I learn the back end? Um, I would just start watching some express tutorials or just learn more about like node and express it's really easy to make a backend like you could build a rest api in like five minutes you just install express make a endpoint um i think the more difficult part is understanding like the authentication authorization side of things and then connecting that to a database persisting data fetching data um it sounds all really complicated but in this day and age there's so many like blog posts and tutorials that show you how to do it that i think you could probably get a fully functional backend written in like a day or so like even with just dealing with one crud operation or like one resource like a to-do list back in where you can create to-do list items and then maybe delete them like just do node make an express app you can even use something like mongo atlas which is like a third-party server or service that's hosting mongodb databases and you can connect your express server to that service to basically store and retrieve data. Again, it all sounds really complicated, but if you watch the tutorial, there's so many tutorials out there that show you how to do it in like 20 minutes. Um, but that's like the starting point, build a backend, and then start connecting that to your front end, and then slowly keep on adding features to your backend and front end, and you'll start building a really big application. Um, let's see. It is deployed to Heroku, so the server would make my project sleep. It would take time to come out of sleep. Okay, so that's why it kind of took like 30, 30 seconds to load or something. Use SK Learn to get the KNN for getting the nearest name. Could you enable a disable anchor tag from another HTML file using JavaScript? Can you enable a disabled anchor tag? I mean, another HTML file. Hmm. Uh, I'm not sure what that means. You mean like you have two tabs open? So you have like tab A and tab B in your browser. And when you're working with this tab, you want it to just disable the anchor on another tab? You disable anchor tag from another HTML file. I'm not really sure what that question is, but yeah, let me know. <clears throat> All right, so here is a neural network and we can draw something. Nice, predicted four, let's do six. Ooh, probably because I didn't leave enough space at the top. Sometimes with these neural network stuff, like if you don't add Adding like it'll mess up. Let's try it again. Oh, no. I think you need to retrain this model, man. It's having some trouble with six. It really thinks it's eight. Maybe make it bigger. Or maybe my sixes just don't look good. 
That's cool. Uh, let's see. I used draw a single digit. Yeah, I guess I'm curious. How did you build this one? I could look at your code, but did you actually build like a canvas drawing thing yourself, or is this like a plugin, and then it converts it to like a bitmap or something? The canvas, when you draw it, I'm sure there's like some function where you convert the canvas to an actual like 2D binary array and then you send that to the back end. Also, is this all run in the server or is this all run in the front end? Shall find out. Okay, let me zoom out. There's too much going on here. Zoom out. Let me go here to the console. I'm trying to go to network and I want to. Hold on a second. Let me get rid of this overview thing. Let's do one. I don't know what's going on. Wait, why does one have? Okay. <laughs> it's like I forgot how to draw the, the number one. Okay, why is this not working? Let me refresh the page. Just do that. How about that? Models fetch. So what's going on here? You're fetching the model, TensorFlow and Keras. And then I guess on the front end, you do something with the, the canvas to convert it to a 2D array for an image. And then you pass that to your model and your model prints out something. That's cool. I don't know, you got some cool projects on here. I really like machine learning. Personal loan predictor. Full battery. This app was made to understand the concept of linear regression. To-do list app. All right, let's see how you do on your to-do list app. Let's get away from the machine learning for a second. Let me close some of these tabs. Save some memory and CPU usage. Cool, cool. It works. Let me look through your source real quick. See what's going on here. To do JS. Cool. Yeah, no, I don't have any, um, I mean, I like I have all these little projects. I think it's pretty cool. Again, if you're, if your goal is to get into machine learning, I would just double down in machine learning and just try to like get as many, get as much experience as you can and try to get into that field. I think it's going to be hard if you don't have a job to get into an actual like machine learning career, because I think most people want to hire like experts at machine learning. But I think it'd be really cool to get into machine learning because uh, web, web development's cool. <clears throat> Sorry, I got to clear my throat. Web development is pretty cool, but it can get, get kind of tedious. You know, it's like you're doing a lot of the same stuff. You're building forms, the forms submit data, the backend processes the data, and then you rinse and repeat that for like every day of your life. So I've always wanted to kind of like switch over to do something else like machine learning. But yeah, I think you're, so far your site looks pretty good. You got some games, insect photography. I have a mini garden when it comes to insects, come and go, so whenever I see one. Yeah, looks cool. Just shows, you know, your interests. I, I like your site because it kind of shows you what you're interested in. It shows that you actually have like an interest in machine learning. You know, you, know, you have like a, a kind of like a passion and then you're also interested in web development. And it's nice that you have like a photography thing to just kind of show more about like you know, you like doing photography. But yeah, I don't know if you had a question about like what exactly you wanted me to look at this. I would definitely put your contact info. Is that even here? LinkedIn. What is this one? Code Wars. Solo Learn. What is Solo Learn? <clears throat> I would put your contact info more towards the top. Like that's, in my opinion, or just have a link that says like contact me. 
um because you want people to actually like f look through your stuff and like figure out how to contact you that's just my opinion what is this solo learn i've never seen solo learn before so it has a bunch of courses See what this does Creating your first JavaScript, your first program variables, comments. So it's kind of just like an interactive course. That's pretty cool. Um, let's check out your LinkedIn. You graduate 2023. All right, let me go back to my chat. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm doing right now. Um, can you, let's see. Semicolon is saying, example, a.html, the anchor tag is disabled, and in b.html, you want to enable the anchor tag that is in a.html. So do you have like one page that's loading into in index files? I'm not really... Are you, so, okay, so you're on a.html, you're messing with your application, and then you redirect to b.html, and you want something to be disabled, you could probably use session storage or local storage. So when the user redirects to a new page, you have some type of value that's stored and shared amongst your pages. I'm assuming you're doing some type of like traditional server-side rendered application where you have every page as its own index file, and you're trying to like share some state in between them. Really, the only way to do that is you can use a cookie, session storage, local storage. Or there's a cool thing where you can actually do like browser communication, but that's kind of not related. Um, <clears throat> the design coded, yes, you have two sibling elements for div something, div hello. It has a block right. When we apply a border style, it will take the whole space. So when you're applying inline block, they sit next to each other, but I am looking for the same effect without sitting each other. Got it. Also with. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure what's going on here. I have used the TensorFlow library. Everything works in the front end. Thanks Rapunzel. And my colon, how about using CSS classes to manage those interactions? Thanks a lot for a review. After seeing my portfolio, will I get a good developer job? <laughs> I, um, I don't know. I don't think your portfolio is the thing that's going to get you the job. It's you being able to actually interview is what's going to get you the job. Um, I mean, the portfolio may help you land an interview. Someone might look through this and be like, oh, that's pretty cool. I mean, he seems like he's interested in stuff. He's, he's actually built out some projects. He obviously knows GitHub. He knows some about machine learning. He's passionate about like different things. But I don't think it'll just get you a job straight off the bat. Like you still need to go for an interview. They're going to ask you questions. You're going to be able to have to like solve and answer their, their problems if they give you practice problems. But the fact that you graduate in 2023, I mean, like you got plenty of time and you got a lot of cool little projects. So I think you're good. I wouldn't worry too much. And the fact that you also have like code wars so you're practicing your like interview question prep i think you're in a good position honestly but what do i know i just know how to put red borders around boxes so that's that's all i know all right y'all i'm gonna wrap up this stream i'm running out of energy it's hard to talk but i hope this helped you be sure to click that like button um before you leave also leave me a comment below if you want to uh see me do more of these little like javascript vanilla javascript projects um if those help you learn but if not also just leave me a comment or join my discord if you want to contact me directly and give me some feedback i'm always open to feedback um that's all i got all right thank you so much for joining y'all uh have a good day and happy coding